Good morrow to you. I am Captain Miles Standish, and I am here today to, to tell you the story of the Plymouth Plantation, Plymouth Colony, founded in the year 1620. Now, I will be completely frank with you. I have no idea how I am communicating you with you through this this mystery, this magic, but uh, I am grateful for the opportunity to share with you my story. Let us begin. Um, there, they say that there's going to be a brief interruption here as we select. Oh, there, there. Ah, yes, there we go. Ah, uh, there we have the images for you. Now, as I said, my name is Captain Miles Standish. I was the military and defense advisor for the young colony uh, of Plymouth many, many years ago. And this is the story of how I came to work for the separatists and the life and the, uh, the creation uh, of the colony itself. Yeah, here you see the lowlands of Holland. I was quite familiar with it. Uh, many years ago, I was sent here by our good Queen Bess, along with many other Englishmen, to fight against the Spanish Catholics. They were trying to subdue the Protestant uh, Dutch and convert them <laughs> into uh, Catholics. Uh, King Philip II of Spain was trying to do this throughout all uh, of the continent itself. But here was a struggle, and our good queen sent our troops in support uh, of the Protestants uh, of that land. This was the site that we came upon there. All of continental, uh, the continental uh, area was involved in some sort of, uh, some sort of battle uh, or war uh, based upon religious intolerance. And here you see the result. The Catholics tried to convert people by killing them. We went to their defense. This is my commander, Sir Horatio Bear. We fought many a battle against the Spanish Catholics there. Eventually, when Good Queen Bess passed away, she was replaced by James I. Uh, he would actually become engaged in a a peace treaty. Those of us who had sacrificed so many years and so much effort in our, our lives and blood uh, to try to help the Protestants there felt that as though we were betrayed by our king. We are very unhappy with him, but it was indeed a time of peace. I would remain in this land uh, with my wife, Rose, and we would reside uh, in a small place that was called Leiden. Leiden in those days was the, the center of the art world, and it was also the center of all sciences as well, a very active place. And it was here that I would encounter the separatists of England and eventually uh, be taken in their employ uh, as their military advisor. The Dutch, despite the fact that their country was racked by war, uh, were very prosperous at this time. They had become engaged in trade with the Far East. The Dutch East India Company was doing very, very well. And that brought a great deal of wealth and prosperity to uh, Holland, to the Dutch. It is shown, as you see here, in the appointments of their homes. Those who are wealthy merchants doing very well. They had libraries, uh, something that was very, very, very unique. Uh, the light was wonderful. The, the light, in fact, was what attracted uh, the famous artist Vermeer. Uh, it became almost a, an integral part of all of his paintings. I share with you this image. This is the bedroom, uh, as it were, and the little curtained area that you see uh, on the right hand side. That is the bed. It is actually walled about the bed because of the inclement climate, the intolerable climate, of course, of Holland itself, very damp and very cold. 
And what is interesting about this is beneath the bed itself, you see where the curtain area is and a little transom that goes across, right below there is a little opening. And what they would do is they would put hot coals in there to warm the bolster uh, above it. It was something that I'd never seen in any other country. And here is another example of that magnificent light that came through these great windows of theirs. And this was what attracted Vermeer. Where did all of the wealth of the Dutch come from? Well, with the trade, the Dutch East India Company. They were importing from China silks and also porcelain. Uh, they from India, they were getting spices uh, from the Spice Islands as well. Uh, and there was a brisk trade, a very lucrative trade in tulip bulbs as well. And it was making the people of Holland very, very wealthy at this particular time. Here you see many of the burghers and wealthy merchants of Leiden all gathered together to have their portraits taken to show off their wealth, of course, how well they were all doing. Many people aspire to this and they would hire artists, of course, to try to record their images for their families and for posterity itself. One of the men who was engaged in portrait painting was this artist fellow. I, I believe his name was von Rhein, Rembrandt von Rhein. And he, uh, might, like many others, were engaged in painting the portraits of these people. And here you see the lady on the left showing off uh, a vast amount of, uh, of lace, very expensive lace. And also the fellow to the side showing his, his very costly cloak with its gold trim, his doe skin gloves. They all wanted to have their images recorded so that people in the future would know how well they had done for themselves. Now, amidst all this wealth, there was a group of people who were not very happy with this prosperity. They were the separatists. They weren't Dutch. These were people who had come, fled actually, from England. And they were escaping a religious persecution. But the Lowlands, Holland, the Netherlands, was known for its tolerance of other religions. And so they came to practice their religion freely and openly in Holland, in Leiden, as a matter of fact. Unfortunately, their children that were born to them in this foreign land were growing up Dutch. They were speaking the Dutch language. They were trying to emulate the Dutch in their ostentation ostentatious dress and this was totally against the precepts of the of the, of the separatists uh, of policies their beliefs so they were not very happy there they wanted to find some place where they could go elsewhere uh, to move again to a place where they could practice their religion freely why why was it so necessary for Englishmen to flee their country, uh, to get away from England itself? Because like the continent, England was engaged in periods of intolerance of religion as well. I suppose it all began with good King Henry VIII. He was a fine Catholic king. He married a Catholic woman, Catherine of Aragon. She bore him a daughter, Mary. But the problem was the king desired more than anything else in the world, an heir, a male heir. And apparently Catherine of Aragon could not produce a male heir. So he looked about for someone who could. He would fall in love with a woman by the name of Anne Boleyn. She was beautiful. She was educated in France. Uh, and he thought she was the perfect person. The problem being that the king was already married. He sent emissaries to Rome, to the Pope, uh, asking for a dissolution of the marriage. But the Pope sent back word saying that he was a Catholic king. He could not divorce. What was he to do? He sent his emissaries back. They pleaded, they cajoled, they sometimes threatened. But the Pope stood firm. He would not renege. And the king was forced to exclaim, to hell with Rome. I will establish my own church and the king himself will be the head of this church. 
for this action, he was excommunicated from Rome. That was fine with him. Now he could divorce Catherine. He could marry Anne Boleyn, which he did. He made her queen of England. And in gratitude, she bore him another daughter. They tried again. Uh, this time she gave birth to a son, but the king seemed cursed because the boy was stillborn. Now, Anne Boleyn was very worried. Henry was very worried that he'd never have an heir. Uh, he began to drum up charges of infidelity against his own queen. She was tried by his advisors. She was found guilty and she was beheaded. Now, the result of that was that the king would eventually marry six times. Six times. And finally, a son was born to the king, the young Prince Edward. But the curse seemed never to leave Henry. For Edward, though he survived birth, did not live to his maturity. When King Henry VIII died, there was no heir. And the throne and the crown devolved to his eldest daughter, Mary. But Mary was the daughter of Catherine of Aragon, a devout Catholic. And so England went from being Catholic to now be, then being Anglican, and then it went back to being Catholic again. She would not tolerate the Anglicans. She called them heretics. She burnt them at the stake, which earned her the sobriquet of Bloody Mary. She would marry, but she married Philip II of Spain. Now, I don't know what you know, or what your understanding of country matters may be, but it is impossible to produce an heir when the husband is in one country and the wife abides in another country. So they had no children, and Mary grew gravely ill. She summoned her half-sister Elizabeth to her. Elizabeth thought she was being summoned to be executed, to be gotten out of the way. But no, Mary offered her the throne and the crown of England. If if she would only promise to keep England a Catholic kingdom. Elizabeth promptly replied in her own manner, famously replied in her own manner, I will do what I think best for my people. This was not what Mary wanted to hear. But Mary died. She died and Elizabeth became the Queen of England. And she would be a fine queen as well. She would tolerate the Catholics, even though the Catholics, many of them, were plotting her demise, her death. They were trying to assassinate her. Uh, Mary, Queen of Scots, openly plotted against her, and she would lose her head for that action. And others would try as well to assassinate the queen, but still she would tolerate the Catholics while promoting the Anglican faith throughout England. Well, you may be aware that when Queen Elizabeth died, having served England nobly for 45 years, she had earned her own sobriquet of the Virgin Queen. She did not marry, she had no heirs. So when she died in 1603, what was England to do? Who was to receive the crown? The next person in line was James VI of Scotland, the son of Mary, Queen of Scots, who was beheaded for trying to kill Elizabeth. So he became James I of England, and he brought with him his own religion. Oh, it was part, uh, he had grown up in the Scottish Kirk, and uh, it was part Catholic and part Protestant, a blend of the two. He had even written his own Bible, the King James Bible. And when he came to England, if people did not join his faith or accept his faith, they would be persecuted. This caused, once again, like throughout all of the continent, it created great tension, religious tension. Nobody knew what to do. There was a group called the Puritans, and they 
informed the king that if only he would divest himself of the uh, of the trappings of Rome, that they could accept his faith. But there were still others who could not. And one of those groups was the separatists, the people to whom I became attached. The separatists believed that the Church of England at that time was corrupt and immoral. They would not join the church. And so their religion was outlawed. Their beliefs were outlawed and they would be pursued by many spies and informers in the pay of King James I. Life became intolerable for these separatists. Their religious sect had begun in the small village of Scrooby, and there they would worship in secret, going to one another at the congregants' houses, uh, and they would have their services there, and at a cover of night, and they would sneak home again. Uh, life was not very good for them. Here are their leaders. Uh, on the left, you see William Bradford, who would eventually become governor of the Plymouth colony, and William Brewster, who was one of the lay ministers, and became very important religious head uh, of the church. John Robinson was the pastor, uh, but he would not come to the New World with the, uh, uh, with the others. He would remain behind to tend to his flock who did not choose to go to the New World. And the last person on the right that you see is Edward Winslow. Uh, he is not well known, but he was the man who was responsible uh, for creating all of the treaties that we would form with the Indians, uh, the natives in the new land that we were going to. This was a religious group. They prayed to God, but at the same time, they had no idea how to defend themselves, how to protect themselves in a hostile new land that they were going to. They needed to find someone to serve as their military advisor and in charge of their defenses. I was not their first choice. The fellow on the right was their first choice. That is Captain John Smith of the successful Jamestown uh, colony. They wanted him. He was too expensive, thank goodness. He was too expensive and they were afraid that he was so famous, so well known, that he might become very powerful and become a tyrant. And so they decided to go with their second choice, which was a humble captain, Miles Standish, myself. Now, in order to find this new, found this new colony, it was necessary to make a business arrangement with someone capable of financing and organizing this. And they met a man, John Robinson met a man by the name of uh, Thomas Weston. And he was a member of the Merchant Adventurers. Now, adventurers uh, meant people who wanted to um, invest uh, in uh, an enterprise and receive some sort of financial return for it. And so the merchant adventurers offered the uh, separatists uh, uh, an offer that they could not refuse. They were offered to, uh, to work for the merchant adventurers uh, to be indentured to them for a seven year period. They would provide the merchant adventurers with cut sawn timber. Uh, they would provide furs from trapping uh, and dried herring from fishing and a certain portion of their crops uh, as well. Uh, and in return, after seven years, the colonists would be free to do whatever, uh, whatsoever they wished to do. They accepted this idea. But the proposal was also very expensive. They could not afford the entire proposition themselves. Thomas Weston offered to add to their numbers certain people who were not separatists. They would call them the strangers. And these people would flesh out the numbers and they would help to pay uh, for the complete voyage itself and the establishing of the new colony. The new colony was to be established in the northern part of the Virginia colony, which was quite extensive in those days. Though this would actually have been a place that would, been, would have been on the, the Hudson River. And that's how far north Virginia went in those days. So everything was agreed upon, hands were shaken, documents were signed, uh, and it was agreed. 
With what little money the separatists had left, they purchased their own vessel. They called it the Speedwell. It was not a large vessel, but it was theirs. And when it helped to carry them across the ocean to the New World, it would remain behind with them. They could use it to explore the, uh, uh, the coastline. They could use it for the fishing industry, but it would very, be very handy for them. So the separatists who were going to the New World uh, would go aboard the Speedwell at Delft's Haven. Uh, and from there, we would sail across the English Channel to Southampton. There, we would find another vessel that Thomas Weston had hired called the Mayflower. We would split the people between the two ships and all of the supplies between the two ships. Um, and the captain of the Mayflower, one Christopher Jones, uh, he wanted us to, uh, to proceed with great haste. There were still minor details to be taken care of and he kept urging this haste because he said, if we left too late, we would lose the season. By the time we got to mid ocean, we would be encountering the storms, the wintry storms that were coming up the Eastern shoreline uh, of the Americas. And so we try to make as much haste as possible. We set sail on, I believe it was August the 5th of 1620. We sailed from Southampton. We had not gone terribly far before there was a great boom from one of the cannons of the Speedwell. When we inquired what was uh, the matter, the captain told us she sprung a leak. We had to go into port and we had to make repairs. We went into Dartmouth and there everything had to be taken off the ship, uh, the cargo, the ballast, everything. She was caulked and sealed, uh, so she was good again. They put everything back. All of this took a week. And Captain Jones was fuming because he said, we're losing the season. When everything was completed, we set sail again. This time we went beyond land's end. England was out of sight and boom, the cannon went off again from the speedwell. This time the captain said, <laughs> she's leaking worse than before. We had to go back to port. The nearest was Plymouth. We went to Plymouth. We abandoned the speedwell. It was not seaworthy enough to make it across the ocean, which meant that everyone who still intended to go to the New World now had to come aboard one solitary ship, the Mayflower. She was not that large. Altogether, there would be 102 uh, people uh, carried by the Mayflower, in addition to a crew of about 30. This would be a very overcrowded vessel. So there you see the Mayflower just before we cast off uh, from the uh, uh, from the Speedwell, got rid of the Speedwell, we're about to set sail. And here you see a cutaway of the decks. Now, we <coughs> people who were taking passage on the ship, we had to satisfy ourselves. The, the leaders would be in what you see listed as the cabin in the stern of the ship. The captain had moved from his cabin uh, up above to the poop house and taken that space. And then we colonists had what was called uh, the gun deck or the tween deck area. You'll notice that large object there called the shallop. That was a, a vessel that we were taking with us. Again, it would belong to the separatists. It had to be cut in half to get down below deck to even fit. And then all of us colonists had to then squeeze down into the tween deck area. The Mayflower was only about a hundred feet in length. She was about 24 feet in the beam wide, and she had a deck head or a ceiling height of five foot four inches. If you were taller than that throughout the voyage, you would have to be stooped over while you were below decks. And here were crammed all of our belongings, the men, women, the children, two dogs as well, all in this tiny space. We had about 55 feet of deck space for everyone to live. It was quite crowded. This is the space on the poop deck uh, that was taken by the captain. Now, you see his berth there on the right, and the berth was so small you could not sleep laying down. You had to sleep semi-reclining in order to fit. And this was true of every berth on board the ship. No one got to lay down flat. Most families had to make do with something like this. This would be a cabin. 
literally a cabin. No privacy whatsoever. The mattress rolled up to one side during the day. Uh, they could sit on the bench-like area. This could be in something that housed an entire family. And the earthenware jar that you see, that was the loo. That was where one relieved oneself and then poured it over the side. So there was not a great deal of space. It was very cramped. And here you see a configuration of what the ship would have looked like, fully loaded with all of the personnel as well. Imagine, my friends, if you had been passengers aboard the Mayflower. This was a voyage that would not be to your liking. You were crammed in this tiny space. And, and when it was rough weather out, out of doors, uh, above decks, they would seal the hatches and put canvas over them. So there was no light and there was very little air below deck as well. You could cook during the good weather, but not during the bad, too much of a threat of fire. Uh, and so uh, you had to eat cold food quite, quite frequently. And the space, because it was so crowded, the ship was rolling from side to side. Uh, you had women and children and men and people weeping and crying and bemoaning their fate. Uh, people getting sick, people seasick for the entire voyage, the smell, the stench, and the people in such close proximity, the smell, and the cooking smells, and the smoke, and all of that was trapped in that tiny little area. And there we would be confined for most of the voyage. You cannot imagine the hellish nature of this trip. You have to realize ships in those days were never designed to carry passengers. They were never intended to carry passengers. But our little ship was now by herself and on her way. We set sail on September the 6th uh, in the year 1620, and we were bound across the ocean. There was no extra vessel to help us if there was any problem. We were very fortunate on the first part of the voyage. The weather was clear, the winds were good following breezes, and we made a swift two miles an hour across the ocean. Now, that would change. The captain, Captain Christopher Jones, was correct in his estimation that if we would leave too late, which we did, we would encounter the storms in mid-ocean. And so we did. And our poor little ship would be tossed about. Imagine again if you were there in the tween deck area, no light, no air. You're being tossed about from side to side. You have, there are no windows. You cannot see what is happening out of doors. You're just being tossed around. It was not pleasant. Sometimes they would have to take in all the sails uh, in the gales that were uh, thrashing us. But the height of the stern castle and the forecastle of the ship was such that it served, the ship itself served as a sail, and we were knocked about uh, by the waves and by the stormy seas themselves. This is what it looked like on the upper deck. Imagine what it felt like down below if you were a passenger, and all the sound of the screaming and the crying uh, that was going on, uh, it was most unpleasant. One of our young men, uh, his name was John Howland, became so frustrated with this, he couldn't take it anymore. He broke open one of the hatches, he climbed up on the deck to get a breath of fresh air, and he was immediately washed over the side by a massive wave into the ocean. He had the forethought that as he was going over, he grabbed hold of a halyard. He was being dragged along in the ocean alongside the ship like a fish in the water, down, going down 10 feet below the waves and then up to the surface again to catch a much needed breath of air. Ah, fortunately, the crew saw him go over the side. They rushed to the side, grabbed hold of the halyard, and they pulled him in hand over hand, drained the water out of him, and he survived. He also promised that he would never again ignore the instructions of the captain. He was a very lucky man. He was washed over the side. He was in the ocean itself, but he survived. And he would go on to become one of the most prolific members of the Plymouth Colony. He and his wife would have 10 children. Their 10 children would give them 32 grandchildren. The most important man. And he was someone who should have drowned on his way across the ocean. In those rare moments of calm, we were allowed to come up to the upper deck and get a breath of fresh air. But then we would be harangued by the crew. They would stand up on the forecastle, glaring down at us. One young man, 
kept calling down to us, you're all going to die. You're all going to die. And when you die, we'll take your bodies and we'll throw them over the side and feed the shards. And we, we will take your possessions. At the end of this voyage, we will be wealthy and you, all of you, will be dead. Unpleasant fellow. I never would join the separatist church, but I must tell you this. I do believe that the Lord God favored the separatists. The first person to fall ill on board the voyage was the young man who had harangued us. And he was the first to die, and it was he who was put over the side and fed to the sharks. Only one of our number would die on the outward voyage, a young servant by the name of Button, Master Button. And during the voyage also, there would be well, there was one during the voyage and one just after we came to land, uh, two births that would take place to balance the loss of life. Mid-ocean, Mistress Hopkins gave birth to a son that they called uh, Oceanus, a very appropriate name. And once we got inside the hook of Cape Cod uh, at our destination, uh, Mistress White gave birth to a son that was called Peregrine. We lost two people. We gain to people. Life has a way of balancing itself. After 65 days at sea and traveling 2,750 miles, the shout was given, land ho. And we were very excited. We finally could set foot on Tierra Firma, but we were cautioned by the pilot of the vessel. His name was John Clark. He had sailed these waters before, and he informed Captain Jones this was not the northern part of Virginia. He recognized the land, and he said, this is what they call Cape Cod. We have missed our destinations, no doubt due to the storms. We have missed it by a few hundred miles. So we could not go ashore. We could not relax. And the captain tried to take us south, but he could not. It was the winter months now. It was November and the gales were coming up the shore and we were trying to sail a square rigged ship into the wind, which you cannot do. You have to go at oblique angles. It's called tacking uh, to work your way into the wind. And the southern part of Cape Cod is known for its shoals, rocks beneath the water. We would have lost the entire ship and probably our lives. We had to settle for our first land site of Cape. God. Of course, the separatists fell on their knees and gave praise to the Almighty for their deliverance, but they did not know what we were about to undertake. One of the things we had to do, because we were in the wrong location, is justify why we were there. And so the leaders uh, sat down and they wrote a document. It was to be called the Mayflower Compact. And it said that we, the loyal servants of King James of England, are trying to uh, better the glory of God by establishing a, uh, a colony and also uh, glorifying the crown. That we would, as a group, organize in such a way and create such laws as befitted those in England, uh, and that we were still loyal subjects of King James of England. And then the men uh, who were of age uh, signed it. There were 41 of us. Now, I was not a separatist, but I signed it uh, uh, anyway as the military uh, advisor. This is the Mayflower Compact itself, and you see the signatures at the bottom. This would be sent back to England uh, along with the Mayflower itself and be given to the uh, merchant adventurers. Now we had to find a place where we could settle. We took the launches, uh, the launch, and then we had put together, we repaired the, uh, the shallop, and we took 14 men. I put them in half armor and gave them uh, matchlock muskets and swords. And then we went to shore and then we walked the length of the spit of, uh, uh, of uh, Cape Cod. And at one point, when we were towards the southern end of it, we came upon a group of Indians. Uh, we were surprised by them and they of us. They loosed some arrows at us, which missed, and we fired a round or two of our matchlocks and they scattered as well. 
These were the first and the last uh, of the uh, Indians that we would see for the next several months. We finally found on the opposite shore, uh, <coughs> we found a protected bay. We went back to the ship, we rowed back to the ship, and the ship Mayflower was brought into this harbor. It was a good harbor, but it was shallow. The Mayflower could not come any closer than a mile from shore. And so we had to use the launch from the ship and our shallop uh, to row back and forth to the land. We tried to be able to get 15 men a day to go ashore uh, to cut timbers and begin construction uh, uh, of our new colony, but it was very difficult. And it was difficult because it was now December. Uh, we landed here on December the 5th. And the gales and the storms meant that oftentimes we could not leave the ship. And sometimes we would get from the ship to the shore and then we would be stuck there in a gale. <coughs> And we have to try to somehow overturn the boat and, and survive uh, the cold wintry blasts uh, away from any shelter whatsoever. Many of our supplies had been destroyed by the storms. Many, much of the grain had molded. Uh, the beer, uh, the casks had broken open. What wasn't spilled out uh, had turned sour, couldn't be used. We had very few supplies. Fortunately, the place that we had decided to establish this colony we could tell that the Indians, the natives, had tilled the ground before, and there were mounds there. When we dug into the mounds, we found wicker baskets filled with some sort of grain. Ultimately, we learned that it was called maize. If it had not been for that grain that we found, we probably would not have survived the first winter. <clears throat> Work was very slow and because the voyage had come to an end, many people were falling ill. They were falling ill very quickly from dysentery and from scurvy and, and also taking the fever. And the cold that was coming through, of course, uh, made people sick as well, and people began to die. I would lose my wife, Rose, in that first winter, and many others would join her as well. In all, during the winter months, we would lose 50 people. We would take the dead ashore and bury them, but we would not mark their graves. We could not afford to let the natives know how few we were or how we were suffering. And so all of the graves that we, we created were, were unmarked. Then. Only, I suppose, by the grace of God did we survive that winter. And uh, Captain Jones and his crew, they would lose over half of the crew, uh, crew of the Mayflower as well. And he was supposed to have simply brought us to the new land, uh, dis uh, disembarked all of our, our goods and our supplies, and then he was to go back, but he didn't. To his credit, he stayed. He offered to stay throughout the month. In the spring of the year, he said, he would leave when we were established there. Thank goodness for that. Thank goodness for the grain that we had discovered that would allow us to survive. We did have the shallop, we could fish, but I must confess, they are very good at prayer, but the separatists are terrible fishermen. And we were not successful in fishing. That first winter almost killed us, but we somehow, through the grit uh, through the bond uh, of these people, the sacred bond of these people, they managed to hold together those few that did survive. And soon the weather would begin to change. The Mayflower would depart in April. They departed and uh, when they did so, they were supposed to take back cut timber and they were supposed to take back furs and dried fish. We had spent the winter simply trying to survive. We had built one shelter, 20, 20 feet by 20 feet. And that was all during the winter months. When the spring came, we began construction again. We had hoped to build 17 homes there. Uh, we were fortunate to have seven, uh, actually, that we could complete. 
This is one of the first houses that we had that got us through the winter. It was actually sort of subterranean. It was dug down into the frozen ground itself, made it easier to keep warm. And those who were the sickest during those winter months were brought into these shelters uh, to help them, to shelter them from the cold. We began construction. Uh, I was trying to uh, instruct the people on how to defend themselves uh, against the possibility of natives arriving, but no natives showed up until the middle of March in 1621. And then, despite all of my warnings to keep on the lookout, an Indian walked right into the colony himself. He put up his hand and he greeted us in English. His name was Samoset. He had been taught English by English uh, fur traders who had come but not established a colony. They had come and they had gone, but he had learned a bit of English in that time. And he would introduce us to others as well. He introdu introduced us to one native who was called Tisquantum. We would call him Squanto. And he was a man who also spoke English. He was one of about 21 natives who had been kidnapped by the fur traders, had been taken to England. He had been taught English and English ways. The idea was to take these Indians and teach them the English language so that when the fur trading was established in the new land, they would have interpreters who knew both the Indian language and the English language. That was the idea. Squanto would be our savior. He would be most helpful to us. We had just struggled to get through, but he would teach us how to plant this maize. He always told us, put a dead fish in the ground before you add the seeds, uh, and that will help your plants to grow, your crops to grow. He would teach us how, how and where to fish, uh, what game there was in the area and how to hunt it, what to avoid. I doubt that we would have survived had it not been for the assistance of this brave, man. There are our crops, our first crops that would come up. It was Squanto also who introduced us to the Sachem of the Wampanoag tribe. His name was Massasoit. And uh, Massasoit uh, and Edward Winslow, whom I men mentioned earlier, uh, they arranged a treaty between us. It was very simple. If the Massasoit, uh, if Massasoit and his people were attacked, we would protect them. We would, we would come to their assistance. If we were attacked, Massasoit and his warriors would come to our assistance. And in the times of peace, there would be free trade back and forth between the natives and the colony of Plymouth as well. It was as simple as that, and it was a good treaty for uh, at least uh, 10 to a dozen years. Little by little, we regained our strength. There were very few of us working, but we worked very hard. We started building these houses. We thatched them as old English houses would be. Uh, we eventually put clapboards uh, on the exterior of the houses. We used joinery uh, that was common to the use in Eng England as well. These houses would serve as well. They were not as pretty as one might find in Lancashire, but uh, they served us well because our first native encounter was a native walking right into the middle of the colony. I cautioned the elders that they needed to create a palisade around the entire colony itself to protect us against uh, hostile Indians who might come to attack. We couldn't allow them to enter as freely as Samoset and the others had. It would take about two months, but we built the palisade that you see here. And that would help us to be safe. We had to teach them how to defend themselves and how to survive in this new world. I had them build fighting platforms uh, within the palisade itself so we could defend uh, the colony. And here you see the colony after we had built many more houses. Uh, the last house that we built was the large structure that you see at the top of the hill. That was a block house for defense, most important. And it was also the place where the uh, se uh, separatists would worship, and it was the home of the governor as well. But if the walls had been uh, uh, in, uh, breached, uh, if indeed we were under attack, uh, the last resort was for everyone to go to the blockhouse and we would fend off the enemies from there. I had to teach the men how to use the matchlocks uh, with the shooting sticks 
Uh, I had to train them in military drill. There weren't that many of them, but I had to train them. I would divide all the men uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the colony into four companies, each one assigned to a different war, one to the north, one to the south, one to the east, one to the west. If the alarm bell rang, they were to immediately go to their homes, secure their weapons, and then go to their appointed positions to help defend the Plymouth colony. For the most part, uh, it was peaceful. There were a few raids that I would have to conduct, and being a soldier, I also believed that it was necessary uh, that we be preemptive, that we strike first if we knew that they were threatening us. Now, this was against everything that William Bradford, the new governor, believed. Uh, we would have many arguments, uh, but ultimately, he would allow me to do what I saw fit to defend the colony, and ultimately, he would come to my defense. He would say, I may not agree with his approach as being preemptive, but I have to confess that in the end, Captain Standish has kept the colony safe. And that was all that mattered. At times, I would have to take native lives, or those who were trying to attack us, or plotting to attack us, attack us. And throughout my career, I tried to be preemptive, to attack them before they could attack us. It didn't always happen that way, but that was what I planned to do. Our first year, we had a, a, a good crop, not a, not a, a um, tremendous uh, year harvest, but a good harvest. We were grateful for our survival, grateful to our friends, the, empty, the Indians, the Wampanoags, uh, for helping us to survive in this wilderness. And we held a feast in gratitude uh, for what we had received. Uh, these are one of our, our two uh, communal ovens and uh, twice a week all of our bread would be uh, baked in these ovens. And ultimately we would put together this feast, this feast of thanksgiving. And to it we invited Massasoit and several of his warriors. Now we were still only about 50, uh, maybe a little more, but when Massasoit and his people arrived. It was Massasoit and 90 of his warriors who showed up. And fortunately, they hunted on the way to come to our feast. And they brought with them five deer that they had slain. So there was plenty of food to be had by all, plenty, plenty of good company as well. The feast would last actually for three days. Now in 1623, we would have a much greater feast. And that was because by that time, William Bradford, the governor, had divided up all the plots of land. They were no longer held communally by the colony, but they were given to individual members of the colony. And he was to they were told, plant whatever you like, harvest your, uh, harvest your goods, keep them, sell them, trade them, whatever you wish. And for some reason, this increased the abundance of our crops enormously. It was very successful. And so was this Thanksgiving feast. Now there were years when it was lean, when we might not hold a feast, but we tried to do it as regularly as possible to give thanks for our good blessings. Eventually, our relations with the Indians in the area would be strained. We, we were the first, the, the Plymouth colony, first to arrive uh, and we managed to survive, but others were coming shortly afterwards. In 1629, in uh, 1621, in the fall, uh, there was a ship called the Fortune that brought 35 new people. They were very upset, the separatists were very upset because they weren't separatists. They were strangers, but they were still bodies and they could help us to build and to improve the Plymouth colony itself. Initially, our friendship with the natives would last for at least 10 years. Uh, but then, with all of these other colonies coming, people did not treat the natives the same as we did. Uh, and there would be tension between us. Young warriors would uh, go gather groups to, uh, to them and they would raid the various colonies as well. This became more rampant uh, as the years went on. And eventually this would lead to bloodshed. Uh, colonial, blood, colonial blood would be shed and also, of course, the blood of the natives as well. One chieftain called Metacomet, living to the south and the west of us, uh, fancied himself King Philip II. Uh, King Philip, I should say. 
and King Philip was going to declare war on all the colleges. We, through our Indian friends, received word of this. I, I was no longer active in the, the defense of the colony, but I was still the military advisor. And I told them, as I always did, you must be preemptive. At Plymouth Colony, several of the others joined together and they put an end to King Philip's war before it could even begin. I would retire to the countryside. Um, I would retire to a place that I called Duxbury. And Habermark, the Indian, the great Indian warrior, uh, would join me and my family. I had remarried, the name was Barbara, uh, and we would live quietly in Duxbury, named after one of my family holdings in Lancashire. What you see here uh, is the New England area and the Indian tribes that lived there. Now, those Indian tribes were many. Uh, they were, there were thousands upon thousands of Indians. How did we survive that first winter? How were we allowed to survive that first winter? It was because, unbeknownst to us, in the year 1614, some English trappers and hunters came to New England and they trapped and hunted. They didn't establish a colony and then they left. But they also left behind smallpox. Now, as it turns out, the natives had no defense against smallpox and it was like a plague. It swept through New England. It swept through New England and uh, the result was that by the time that we had arrived in 1620, 90% of all of the Indians of this area had died of smallpox. That was why there was no resistance when we first came. That is why Massasoit wanted to treaty with us because he was one of the tribes that was hit hardest and there were very few people and the other tribes, the larger tribes were coming to them and demanding tribute of them. And so he wanted someone to defend him. It was this bit of luck that allowed us to survive against all odds. As I said, Plymouth was the vanguard and others would follow and soon many others would follow. And colonies were springing up all along the Eastern shoreline itself. Here you see part of that inundation of colonists, Puritans coming from England and the Scotch and Irish and the people from the West countries. They came with many ships, with fleet, fleets of ships and thousands and thousands of colonists. And eventually they were pushing back the natives, taking their land from them, not treating them well. And it was only understandable that this tension would cause an outbreak of violence against the colonies themselves. But for little Plymouth, we managed to survive that first winter. It was hard and yet we survived it. And by the fall, we were growing our crops and the village itself, the colony itself was growing. And although we would have times of want, we would never starve again. And Plymouth would be considered one of the successful colonies in the new world. That is all that I can share with you of my, my story. And I hope that it has uh, enlightened you uh, in some way about this colony and uh, about what life was like, the life of your forefathers was like many years ago. Again, I don't know how it is that I am able to communicate with you, but I thank you. I thank you for your time and your interest in my little subject. And so I bid you farewell.